If you enjoy Astronomy FM Radio, please let us know with a small donation. We do rely on your support, and it's true. Every little bit counts. AFM. You're listening to AFM Radio on Astronomy.FM, around the world and beyond. Arr. Coming up next, it's time for an AFM Radio original program, Space Pirate Radio, brought to you by the voice of astronomy, matey. This is Astronomy.FM. The pirates are coming. The pirates are coming. The pirates are coming. You better watch out. Yep, we are good now. Skype is uh, finally cooperating. We are live. Go ahead and do it, man. Do do the opening that you do oh so well. The voodoo that I do to do to do. It's we're live right now. All right, then here we go. We we'll start over, everybody. Get ready for it. Arr! It's Space Pirate Radio time. Buck goes here on astronomy.fm radio, of course. It is uh, another Wednesday evening. This one is January the 31st, 2018, 9 o'clock ish in the evening. Uh, for those of us in the eastern portion of North America, Universal Time would put it at 2 o'clock in the morning on uh, Thursday morning, February the 1st, 2018, Universal Time. So if either of those happens to be your time, that means, yes, you're listening to us live right now and of course that means our astronomy.fm chat room is ready for you to come on over board the ship be a part of the space pirate crew go to the home page astronomy.fm and look at the top there it says radio chat click on that type in some sort of name that we can pronounce and be nice and hit login and you'll be here in our chat room where we're going to put links to any articles that we happen to reference and uh You'll be able to click on those links and read the articles in, in more depth a little bit later. Wait for Diane to come in. Uh, Oi. She's here. Greetings, Diane. Greetings, Greetings, Captain. Had a little bit of trouble boarding the ship tonight. Ah, uh, paddle faster. Indeed. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're just getting started here, as you, you've heard, of course. So um, just said hi to everybody in our chat. And I didn't say individually so we'll do that right now aqua for you savage twist edge light breeze you me glenn plaid joan cassie plaid mac evil spock plaid sister always always open for more people to come on over to the the chat room and uh and join us if you have any astronomy questions you know, type them into the chat try to read them and try to answer them right on air as you uh, as you come on in so feel free to do so all right, all kinds. Of, well, we had uh, sorry, we had a little issue with our web page earlier. It was it was down, but we got it fixed a couple hours ago, so we're all good with that. Yeah, we're working on the working on the web page. You might see some uh, um, cha- slight changes. Definitely some improvements coming up. No time schedule, but um, working on it. Nice. Always that, always that background stuff that comes in first, you know, and then then the stuff that shows. So we're continuing to improve as best as we can. So, Marty, how was your lunar eclipse experience? Uh, I sat here nicely and watched a movie. No way. Yeah, that, was, that was in the morning, so no, I, I was asleep. <laughs> yes, it was in the morning. It was actually the moon from where we are, though you are very close to the mm-hmm. edge of the eclipse zone. Mm-hmm. From where we are, the moon would have set just before, minutes before totality. Okay. But it didn't matter because it was completely cloudy. That's what I thought. So I was driving down I-94, which is a south. So I was going southwest down a freeway. Okay. In flat basically terrain. From de- basically from Detroit towards Chicago. Right. For reference. And it would have been perfect for a view. Yeah. Except there was nothing to see. Absolutely nothing to see. Oh, good. Then I didn't get up for a good reason. A better reason. Indeed. Um, now, we do, do have a colleague from our astronomy club, the Warren Astronomical Society, who is in Hawaii. Ah. And he suffered some clouds, but ah. he did get a picture. But he suffered some clouds in Hawaii in nice weather. We're and not, he get, and he we're not crying, no. We're, not crying for him, no. He goes there every year in the wintertime. Nice. But that pretty much puts you like on the opposite side of the world, opposite side of the world, pretty much kind of for everything. So... We miss it here in Michigan. Usually, the Pacific Ocean can catch most of the other things. Sometimes not, but mostly. 
Oh, well, it's fun to be able to travel around the world. For even well, he just goes to Hawaii for vacation, but yeah, uh, he's had a condo there for decades. But, yeah, so very nice, very nice way to do it. Mm-hmm. But it would be nice to just go traveling around. I used to do that a long time back in the single days. I would travel for astronomy. That was that. Well, actually, I was talking with our club's program director tonight, and he was discussing that we might want to do a, a little anthology of talks about the farthest people in our club, mind you, have gone. Okay. To answer the call of astronomy. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if it counts as astronomy, but sort of astronomy. Well, and he's not, I don't know if he's a member of a club, but we do, we do know somebody that went all the way to the South Pole. Yeah, he was trying to do some astronomy because he was trying to get into an observatory down there. Mm-hmm. But when he got down there, they wouldn't let him in. Ah, pound in the door. And well, he could have got in alone on his academic credentials. Mm-hmm. But then they found out that he to actually get transported to the pole, he joined a tour group. And so if he had somehow managed to, I guess, charter his own private plane down to the South Pole, they might have let him in. But they said, nope, sorry, and... Denied. Uh, so he took some pictures of the exterior of the building. It was uh-huh. still a very interesting presentation because he went to the South Pole. That's uh-huh. that's really something in a seventy-year-old DC three. Uh-huh. So that would kind of beat a lot of records. Other than that, <sighs> that's hard was... to top. You would really have to get to the ISS or the Moon. Uh-huh. <laughs> Good luck with that. I've been as far south as Bolivia, but several club members have been also. Have we've had some members go down to Cape Town. Are they going to Cape Town too? Okay. Yep. First there was drawing. a solar eclipse. There was a solar eclipse back there. Possibly okay. not in my lifetime, but. All right. Anybody listening in Cape Town? I hope you uh, you get your water issues fixed. Yes, indeed. Okay. We can even talk a little bit about that. Uh, climate change, things warming, uh, changing weather patterns. Uh, in case you're not familiar with it, Cape Town. Um kind of near the southern tip of Africa there, is suffering a dramatic, dramatic drought. Big city of about, what, 4 million people, I think. And without water con- conservation, they think in all their fresh water would be dried up in April. Now they're starting to update that because they're, they are doing some pretty good water conservation. So basically, you get to drink it, cook with it. And not too much else, and they should last a little longer unless they get some rain. But uh, quite an issue yeah, for a really the, big city. Yes, it would be the first major modern city to run out of water. Mm-hmm. And the people there, for instance, I, I believe what the figure I saw cited was that the average American uses 83 gallons of water a day. And the people at Cape Town with Rationally we were down to 11 uh huh. I was going to say even eight gallons. So it's not like they're not trying, but yep. there's only so much you can do without getting your supply refreshed by rains and things like that, too. So it's in the middle of summer, too, down there, too. So it's got all combined together. And uh, best of luck, uh, as Glenn saying, desalination. Uh, it's something that might be considered obviously for a big city that would be a really big probably multi-year uh endeavor to build something big for a city i think the middle east has a lot of desal some of the middle east has some desalination um complexes so that could be done but yeah that's uh, well they said they're, they're going to set up some drinking water stations but only at 200 stations in a whole city not enough shipping water so going to be some issues there we'll keep uh Keep an eye on that and hope for the best of that area. And uh, now that's just the same, but you know we still have a city here in Michigan with undrinkable water. Yep. That was political more than natural, though. So that city, Flint, actually still needs fresh water brought in for its residents, too. Yeah, because the, the pipes were so badly damaged. Yeah, they switched to, uh, instead of lake water, big, big, you know, Great Lakes water, they switched over to the local river water, which was highly polluted. So they added some chemicals to get rid of the pollution, and it ate through the coating, which was covering 
um, the lead lead joints, and I think there's even some lead pipes still on the ground. So, well, it, and they weren't using the right ratio, and there were there were a lot of issues going on. I mean, the the water was bad enough that the GM, I believe it's still GM, the car plant on that river was having issues with the water corroding machinery. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, not really desirable. So, our first, well, Cape Town first big invite. Well, one of the f- most recent big environmental issues happening. We'll see what we'll see how the world goes. Yeah, I mean, the, certainly back in the day, cities ran out of water. I was doing a little research on the Stonehenge area, Marty, because I'm okay. planning to go there the first oh, nice. week of March. So, newsflash: Marty will be flying solo the first week, full week of March. Okay. Um, and learned a bit about the town of Old Sarum that I'd heard the name, but I didn't know much about it. Well, back in a millennia ago, it wasn't a nice green scenic place. It was very uh, hostile. It was chalk. It was dry. It was dusty. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the water was apparently uh, ran out or close to it. It was very difficult to get water out of the wells. So they packed up the city and moved two miles away and just left it. Hmm. That's what you did back in the day. Mm-hmm. That, those were not cities of four million people, needless right. to say. Uh, it's not similar environmental issues happened down uh, um, Mexico. Was it the Aztecs or the, uh, what was the other? The Maya? Mayans, yeah. Maya. Yeah, they, they abandoned cities, too. Could it be water issues? It was thought maybe, too. Um, Saharan Desert. Then used to be a desert. Thought it used to be oh. trop- tropical. Well, certainly humans have weathered climate changes that were natural in origin. Mm-hmm. There were some, though, certainly tree cutting and things like that did affect landscapes. Uh, I remember even hearing when I was a kid the story that the cedars of Lebanon, Lebanon used to be forested with cedar trees, and then they all got cut down. Mm-hmm. All human activity. Um. But another thing that I was reading about with the the area around Stonehenge is you have this era where the people were building the megalithic monuments, and then it seems like there was the climate changed, farmland became bogs, they stopped building the monuments, they started sacrificing people to the bogs. It had a huge impact on their society, and the course of the development of the people in that area totally changed. Mm Mm-hmm. And their lifestyle had to change with it. The farther back, way back, um, there was obviously not so much um, population. And there was also people that were, could have migrated to a different area, too, without as much impact in the area for some people. You know, there were plenty of resources in another area. If it wasn't populated, you could migrate a little bit to a, a better area. Not always. But sometimes now it's kind of harder to do that, kind of hard to move 4 million people within a year to another area. Well, we'll see how they handle it and uh, keep an eye on that. And it will be a lesson to many other cities around the world that are going to face similar crises. Mm-hmm. Oh, let's see. Look, we had a little, a little big anniversary today. Oh, did we? Yes, January 31st, 1958, Explorer 1. Was Aha, that is indeed a major, major milestone of the U.S. space program. Yes, it was their first successful. Emphasis uh, on successful. Yes. There uh, were many attempts. It wasn't, the, wasn't the first launch. No. Yeah, a lot of them went up partway, came back, or... Or, well, just actually separated on, on the launch pad right with the ignition point. But uh, I was the first one to actually send a uh, American satellite into orbit, Explorer 1. That was the one that uh, went through the um, – and actually had some scientific equi- equipment on it. It wasn't just like a, a radio beeper like the, the Russian Sputnik was. Original Sputnik, yeah. Yep. Uh, it had a cosmic had, ray detector, so yes. it uh, was looking at the radiation in Earth's orbit. And the guy behind the experiment was a Dr. James Van Allen from the State University in Iowa. Mm-hmm. 
guess what the results of that experiment are now called? The Van Allen belts. The Van Allen belts that keep us safe from radiation. Mm hmm And um, I'm going to say, oh, there's, there's actually doing more uh, probes. There's actually like a cluster of four space probes. I can't remember what the name of them are right now uh, that are basically measuring um, – the mag- still measuring the magnetic field and the interactions with the solar um, solar particles, the solar wind. And I can't remember that mission right now. I'm going to have to see if I can find it. Well, anyways, they're, they're actually catching interactions of magnetic fields between the solar winds and uh, the Earth's uh, magnetic field. We'll find out what, that, what that's called. It's in the news just recently. But. And a... Another, well, I think I mentioned this before, that a a uh, satellite has been discovered to have come back on. I love this story. And who mm-hmm. discovered it, Mark? Oh, just some amateur radio astronomers. Yes, indeed. Another triumph of amateur astronomy. So I've actually been carrying around this story on my phone, the uh, Ars Technica version of it. Amateur search for dead spy satellite turns up undead NASA mission. Uh-huh. So, a guy named Scott Tilly, let's, let's credit him by name, mm-hmm. he was looking for secret military satellites. It's, some, it's his hobby. And in this case, he was inspired by the recent high-profile apparent failure of the Zuma satellite, the top-secret U.S. spy thing that was... Um, Launched on a SpaceX rocket and a Northrop Grumman a docking latching mechanism, and something didn't go quite right. So that's all shrouded in secrecy, but he, you know, he was looking. Mm-hmm. Well, he found a radio signal and he was able to match its orbit to a satellite called Image. Some of you might remember Image, it did ring a bell when I saw it. It was a, a magnetosphere experiment. Mm-hmm. And it was launched all the way back in 2000, and it disappeared in 2005. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Imager stands for, um, uh, I mean, uh, image stands for Imager for Magnetopause to Aurora Global Explorer. It's another bad acronym. I know. Like, so it made really? a three-dimensional map of the particles that move along the Earth's magnetic field lines. Mm-hmm. And then, boom, it was gone. So, the orbit occasionally takes it into the shadow of the Earth, which would reset the power. So, NASA waited for two years for it to reboot itself. The first time it entered Earth's shadow, nothing happened. And they gave up. I'm like, okay, it's dead. Well, it rebooted itself at some point along the way. Mm-hmm. So, um, at the time of press, you know, they were working to identify that it was image, so seems mm-hmm. likely. So, that has and, been confirmed now? Yeah, and see what data they can get out of this thing that's been up there since, you know, for 18 years. So, that's a, it was a great little heartwarming triumph of the amateur story. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know that there were actually amateurs that were, um identifying at least the positions of satellites using radio antennas. Yeah, well, it was really cool seeing uh, pieces of the amateur community surface when Zuma um, failed to do what it was expected to do Mm -hmm. because you've got all these different data streams like this guy's like, okay, you know, we've got this piece of uh, quasi, we've got this appearance in official catalog, and we've got this bit and this bit and this bit, and uh, it's cool. Almost makes me want to get into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, join the fun. It's a lot of work and a lot of it uh, is. Uh, tech, techniques and stuff like that too. So yeah, I don't even uh, have a ham license, so I'm <laughs> behind the curve. Uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. It's like okay, so he, um, you can find a satellite, and if you got a you know direct, I, I was assuming he was using a directional dish antenna. And point around the sky, and all you have to do is pick up a signal, you know, keep scanning different bands for signals that satellites will broadcast back to Earth. Now, you might not be able to read that signal, 
Uh, obviously, it would be <laughs> hi- highly encrypted, being a uh, you know a, a spy satellite. But you actually can detect the signal itself. And if you, I'm sure you some computer programs, a lot of public information, figure out which satellite it actually is, and technically you've actually pinpointed a a satellite, whether it's a public weather science or spy satellite. Yeah, you know, and I'm sure that if an amateur can do it with you know backish yard equipment, uh, other major countries can easily do the same thing. Well, keep in mind, I mean, uh, Rob in the chat room, Rob, our engineer in our private channel commented you know, three dollar signs. So your well healed amateur might be able to scrape together quite an impressive array compared with, mm-hmm. say, a research institution. <laughs> Lots of a discretionary budget. Oh, some people have expensive hobbies. I mean, we know about astronomy. Yeah, I, I think, think we. Think, I think we are those people, Marty. Kind of up there. Well, I don't know if you think about it. Some people get into like RVing, and that's up to a million dollars to travel around the country. And they have a regular. That's not the ones that live in them. That's the ones that do it for fun. So there's people with some money, and they like to spend it on things that they do. So, yep, there's some big bucks being spent. On hobbies and different types. I'm flying to Toronto for funsies on a World War II era cargo plane. (laughs) That'd be fun too. Unpressurized, mind you. That'll be real interesting. Well, then you don't fly as high. No. Yeah. 10,000-ish feet or so. Also no bathroom. Well, that's a different issue. Yes, Glenn. Very good. It's a C-47. Glenn in the chat room landed the pit. All righty. Well, let's go through uh, what's up in the sky, I guess, this week. Uh, so tonight, obviously, because this morning there was an eclipse of the moon, that means, yes, we're still enjoying a mostly full moon, uh, even though it was yeah, right at uh, sunrise for us. Um, I did get to see the legit full moon through a sucker hole last night, and it was beautiful. Was so it? we're not, we will not say the word. The astrology term. <laughs> it's, it's, show. it's not an astrology term because, um, okay, I won't say it for you, but being exercised. Does it was it, a very nice moon. Yes. It was full and technically bigger than usual because it was closer for at least somebody, not everybody though, because you really need to be in the right part of the earth at the right time as close approach to its earth and its orbit. Otherwise, you're really... You know, when it's on the horizon, it's automatically 4,000 more miles away from you. So basically, when you have the actual full moon and the actual perigee closest to the Earth, and it happens to be midnight, that is the one spot on the Earth that basically has um, the, you know, technically the the closest moon and technically the largest arc angle size of the moon itself. And, well, the moon just basically looks kind of full for three days anyways, for the most part, depending on what it is. So we still have a full moon tonight. Ah, there's one I was thinking about earlier. Series at Opposition. I didn't know that was coming up, but I did happen to look on my, we'll jump around here a little bit, on my Stellarium star chart and did come across the planet Ceres. It is approximately in the constellation of Cancer the Crab. So between Castor and Pollux and um, not Regulus. Well, the head, the head of Leo the Lion. What's that? What's that? Leo. One? Oh, between as far as the star goes, Algeba, Al-Gen- the double Algeba. 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 is you're you're getting one of the claw stars. Zubin uh, Nelga Nubi, Zubin no, no, that's, that's Zubin Nelga Nubi. That's in yeah. uh, Libra. That's now. Leo. That's Libra. Yes, but this is Cancer the Crab. So, uh, El Janubi oh, is, okay. is that tip of the crook of the head of Leo the Lion. So, approximately between there and Castor and Pollux, I said, which that's pretty much like Cancer the Crab is where Ceres is located at now. Ceres, uh, not too hard to see, actually, through a small telescope. Might be able to, should be able to pick it up. Binoculars, I do believe. Let's see. Well, this is kind of strange. Why does it say, 
Magnitude. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the star instead of series. Let me click on series and find out uh, what magnitude it's listed as. No, that's not it. I got to zoom in more. Getting closer. All right. It must be this object is series. There we go. Uh, 6.85. Definitely a pair of binoculars should be able to see series. The asteroid. Number one asteroid. At, of course, the uh, Dawn mission happens to be in orbit around right now. Still sending back data. And you can actually look at it. It says it's at opposition. That means it rises at uh, uh, sunset and hits the meridian. The line between north and south passing straight overhead, and it'll pass that at about midnight for opposition. So pretty much in the sky all night long, and uh, obviously for uh, it is north of the ecliptic. So it's going to be a little easier for uh, uh, northern hemisphere observers down to somewhere around the equator, a little bit, a little bit below that. Uh, should be able to see series, no problem. Well, pretty much everybody can kind of see most of the ecliptic anyways. All right, let's go back to, let's see if we got anything else this week. Ah, okay. Um, Regulus on Thursday, which is tomorrow, 19 hours universal time, uh, will be 1.0 degrees south of the moon, and there will be an occultation. And going to the website of... Uh, uh, lunar occultations, it says it's going to be visible um, from northern Europe and northern Asia. So if you live in that area, you'll be able to see the moon occult regulus. Got one coming up, uh, nice. another, occult, another occultation uh, next week on the 8th. So I'll get to that right now. Ah, uh, shoot, what's that? Why? Is that a delta or gamma? Hmm. Gamma. Let, gamma, okay. The funny looking why is gamma. Fine looking wise, Gamma. All right. So the moon's going to go in front of Gamma on February the 8th. Gamma's uh, close to fourth magnitude, so it'll take a, a little bit of an effort to see that one with the moon. Yeah. I mean, that's cool, but not as cool as first and second. Yeah, but. I know, but at least it's, you can see an occultation. It's an occultation. That's, yep. Actually, depending on your viewing conditions, that could be an interesting challenge. Mm hmm. And depending on phase of the moon. Indeed. Which should be... Phase of the moon makes it interesting. It's going to be last quarter. Okay. Because this is full moon. So a week from now should be last quarter. That means that the the bright side of the moon will hit it first, and then it'll come out the dark side. That's the coolest part, when you see a star just blink into existence from nothing. Mm-hmm. That's to be visible from uh, Europe, the Middle East, and Western Asia. So. Check that out. And I think that's getting more coming up. I think that that's it um, for this week's moon and planets and stuff like that in the sky. So we might as well do our break Station time. Station identification. Yeah. I think so, too. Get ready. You are. Are. Listen to Space Pirate Radio here on Astronomy.fm. It is now almost 9.30 in the evening on January the 31st, 2018. So that would make it universal time of uh, February the 1st, 2018 at 2.30 in the morning. You're listening to us live. We have another half hour of live programming. But don't forget, we're going to come up. We're going to have, uh, we're sorry, we're going to repeat this program every four hours for the next 24 hours with programming in between like Astronomy Ireland, Planetary Radio, Planetary Scientists, Naked Astronomy, Naked Scientists, all coming up after Space Pirate Radio. So you can, if you don't catch us live, you can catch us during the repeat time. But don't forget, during this live time, this is when the best time to come on over to our chat room right on the homepage, Radio Chat. You'll see the link. Click on that. And I'll get you to the chat room. We've got uh, you and me. We've got Aquafuse, Savage, Twist Edge, Light Breeze, Glenn, Plaid Joan, Plaid Mac, Evil Spock, Sister Plaid. We consider you part of our crew when you uh, join us here in the chat room. So come on over, everybody. And uh, we'll put links if we talk about specific articles or things like that. We'll put a link into the chat room. And then after that, the link will appear on our Space Pirate Facebook page called Space Pirate Radio Astronomy.fm. And if you're listening to the repeats, you can go to the 
go to the Facebook page and you'll be able to click on the links and uh, look at the pictures of the article that we're talking about uh, while we're talking about it. I guess that so, kind of does it all. I actually have a blog post that I've been thinking about for a little while that I wanted to share. Okay. So this is an opinion piece out of Scientific American. Okay. And it's got a kind of a clickbait title. Mm-hmm. Is the golden age of astronomy nearly over? But it's an interesting piece. Uh, just in summary, the idea that with the we've discovered an incredible amount about the universe in the last few decades with the era of the Hubble Space Telescope, um, ALMA, the other huge telescopes that could not have been possible without modern multi-mirror technology without adaptive optics, all the stuff that we've, we're using now instead of, say, Palomar and the great telescopes of the early to late 20th century. Mm-hmm. Big astronomy, in other words, capital B, capital A. And so the idea is we, we've got all this incredible array of telescopes. We've lo- collected so much data. We've learned so much. But now, to get beyond that, the price tag is so mind-bendingly high that we may be on the verge of, you know, too big to fail, or guess what? That means you'll fail. And so it's like, it's an opinion piece again, but it is worth thinking about, you know, when we contemplate the launch of the James Webb and what comes after that. So I've been thinking about that for about a week or so. It's like, yeah, you know, let's recommend that to our listeners just to see, you know, how they feel. I'm thinking no, because everything has always been expensive. It's just been relative. So basically, with inflation, we can afford more bigger stuff. Price tag's bigger, but inflation kind of kind of covers that. So, yeah, just think of that. You know, for that Palomar mirror, how expensive that was, and how expensive every all the new developments were. And the whole observatories were back when they were big bucks when money wasn't as inflated so much. So I think it's all relative, and I think yeah, the improvements will coming. Uh, I don't think definitely not the end of astronomy. Uh, it, it can only be the end of astronomy if it's the end of uh, modern civilization. <laughs> so yeah, that's if the, true. If the so whole I civilization did, collapses, yeah. Well, I did want I did want to mention that one of the the parts of this hypothetical end of the golden age of astronomy is because, say, the James Webb has been so expensive to assemble and it's not yet launched. Other projects are sacrificed for it. A flagship telescope does come at the cost of other projects Mm -hmm. and it takes a long time so you've got the james webb hopefully going up soon it will be exponentially more powerful than the hubble and the spitzer its effective predecessors Mm -hmm. but if the new telescopes that follow it cost in time and money what it did you know relatively speaking it'll probably take another decade to get them up by the time they're up the james webb might well be on its last legs because, of course, unlike the Hubble, which could be repaired multiple times, nobody's going up there to fix the web. Mm-hmm. Ain't happening. Well, the web has a problem. You never know. You never know. But with our, the, what we've got. Our launch happening. technology is improving now. It is improving. So and it yep. could be that if we have a concerted effort to dedicate the time and the money and the people hours into astronomy, everything keeps barreling happily along and we learn more about the universe than we ever dreamed to know. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't get the support, you don't get the funding, guess what, you don't get the results. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, like I said, it's an opinion piece, but I felt it worth the recommendation. Sure. Predicting the future is just impractical, I find. Especially for, like, a whole of society and things like that. You just yeah, but work. if you... One thing I, lo- I like... Whenever people go around, oh, you know, Y2K, Y2K, what an overhyped mess, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Uh-huh. Because people recognized the problem uh-huh. and dedicated the money and the research and the people hours into making sure nothing happened. Uh-huh. Consequently, nothing happened. And everybody let's go, oh, Y2K, that was hilarious. No, a crisis was spotted. A concerted effort was made. And everything turned out fine. 
Mm-hmm. That's a good thing to model. Uh huh. But mm, the things that surprise me don't surprise me. I don't want to say a lack of intelligence or lack of education, but if society can overcome its emotional disability towards certain things, um, I won't even mention the organizations. It's just like, I don't call them stupid, but they're just controlled by their emotions. People that believe things um, in science that are so not true that you would think there's no way anybody could believe something as stupid as that, but they do. And there's lots of them. And I think it's all basically an emotional, obviously an emotional thing. It is an emotional thing, but you know, you've got examples, whether it's like you want to look at the moonshot or, or the, even the Russian space program, getting a human being up in space and bringing them back down safely or, Mm -hmm. you know, any of these engineering triumphs, including Y2K as much Mm -hmm. as it's the butt of jokes or including the Hubble, mm-hmm. because fixing the Hubble was huge. Mm-hmm. But again, this thing was up there. It was faulty. The gyroscopes were failing. The camera, the optics are crappy. It was the butt of national jokes, international jokes, probably. And we fixed it. Mm-hmm. And good science happened. Well, we fixed it to us, but to people that don't think NASA basically puts things in to space that's the kind of attitude i'm talking about we yeah but there's to, always there's always going to gonna be there's always going to be a core of people and it might be as much as you know one well, in 20 well it's it might be as much the, as four in 20 if it's a core if it's bigger than a core if it's like over 50 percent if it's over 50 percent you got problems you got if problems it's down like around the t- 33 and a third and down uh-huh. you can at least get your science done or whatever it is you're trying to do you will never convince every single person. Nope. I, I'm still having arguments with coworkers about whether or not we went to the moon. You know, <laughs> I know that's what I'm kind of saying. I like, even that, it, you know, though it's totally provable, it's their emotions that won't let that proof come through. Yeah, okay. It's I'm, not going to happen, and there's no s- fixing that. Right? Or, there's no. Or, there's or, no or fix- is there, maybe there is, but we don't. We're, maybe so, we aren't advanced enough in science to fix that kind of thing. But move on to the things that you can fix. Don't don't bash your head against the wall. Move on to the things that you can fix. Uh-huh. But it's it's tough when, especially if you have a majority of people controlling things that use their emotions emotions to uh, you know get themselves away from reality. Then you get it's bad. So that could happen to science. It's happened. It's well, it's it's, it's, it's an flowed. issue here in the states. You know, we've got some weird quirks in our national uh, science education. Uh-huh. Arguably holding us back in certain fields, but uh-huh. you know, hey, and our that's what you can fix. Our whole educational process. So maybe it'll get fixed. Maybe not. But it's been that way throughout history too. I know. So. It, exactly. So it'll take some kind of something to fix all of that but humans we'll are people yeah we're critters mm-hmm. very clever critters and we mm-hmm. build amazing tools uh let's see we got a couple i didn't read these yet but a couple alerts from the aavso american association of variable star observers a couple of novas and new ones not the one that was in muska um, Which is well out of range for anybody up here in Michigan to see. Yeah, because that one's like twenty-five degrees from the South Pole. All right, we've got. Yeah. Uh, let me put this. Let me put this into our um, chat room here, and then we'll go through it. We've got two of them coming up. Here we go. It is in. Where is it at? Uh, hmm. Ninth magnitude. Where, where, where? Nova CIR. What's CIR? Is there a constellation that stands starts with CIR? Oh, it's far I'm, south again. It's free the far I'm south. In my brain, yeah, it's definitely a southern constellation. I'm trying is, to remember the name. Is that is that Muska? No, it can't be Muska. No. Uh, okay, it's at like sixty-seven degrees south. Mm-hmm. So I don't see the constellation, but I can look it up on. Um, 
which caught my stellarium in just a little bit. All right, we'll kind of go back to that one. So ninth magnitude, the one in Moscow was seventh magnitude. So let me go back to uh, the alerts again. And this one is in Scorpius. And let's see if this one's got a reported magnitude of 11th magnitude. So that one. You this won't remember this one, Marty. This one's kind of dim. And that's, uh, well, obviously Scorpius. Most people know where Scorpius is at. Yeah, most people know where Scorpius is. The, the constellation of the other nova is the compass. Uh, the compass? Yeah. And what's, it, what's its name? Circinus. Circinus? Okay. Yeah. So if you wanted to go all classical Latin, it would probably be something like Kirkinus. Okay. But Circinus. All right. Oh, wait. One more alert notice. A flaring of Blazar 3C279. Yeah, you can get all these on the um, AAVSO, American Association of Variable Star Observers webpage. And they, they right out, right on the homepage, right in the front, they list all the things, these notices that are happening. And let's see, is this one actually flaring up or they want some uh, observations of this one? Uh it's, oh, it's a collaboration has been called for observations of the Blaze R3C 279, which is undergoing a major gamma ray flare. Okay, so this is not beginner astronomy. Uh, it might be. Oh, wait, no, this one's dim also, really dim. It's about six, 16th magnitude, but it's, well, within the range of advanced astrophotographers. I was going to say, uh, I'm not capturing gamma ray bursts with my 8-inch. <laughs> well, not, not visually, but you yeah. could be able to do it photographically. You know. So what they want, obviously, I'm thinking that they... Not are, without investing in a better mount. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I would assume they want some <coughs> optical observations of this. They're picking up in gamma rays. Then I'm assuming that they want uh, some optical... Uh, Confirmation? Op- observations of it too basically comparisons they want to compare what's the op what's the optical uh of um, magnitude brightness of it compared to the gamma ray brightness of it so so check that out and if you got the equipment something to do i had i lost this article there was an article of uh one of the women of um, what was it? Um, the Ebola collision, new, the neutron star collision people. Oh, okay. I wanted, I no, think I one, did not see that. One of the women won an award for nice. that observation. I can't remember what it was or who it was or where I saw that. Uh, I thought I was going to say, oh, I, yeah, I was trying to save it. And then I had to close up my computer and get the restart and stuff like that. So I lost that article, but that's out there too. So I can't remember well, her name. I have, I have another blog piece to share with y'all, but it's about something a little less mind bending than the dark future of astronomy and the big big data era. Okay. It's about the humanity star. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Did you talk about the humanity star at all on any of the other programs, Marty? I think I did a little bit, but we could do it again. Yeah, so to catch y'all up, there's a private space company called Rocket Lab. And they launched an object from uh, New Zealand. They put some small satellites into orbit. Okay, fine. Nanosatellites, cool, cool. But they had an additional payload on that rocket. It's highly reflective. It's about the size of a meter. It's like a little geodesic sphere. They're calling it the Humanity Star. Here's a quote from Rocket Lab's website. Visible from Earth with the naked eye, the Humanity Star is a highly reflective satellite that blinks brightly across the night sky to create a shared experience for everyone on the planet. Mm-hmm. And honestly, a little weird, but it's, I think it's kind of cute. I'm one of those people who feel sad that all the Iridium satellites are going to be deorbiting, the, the original ones rather. There will be new iridiums, but they won't be catching the light. It's like, well, but, eh, you know, there's an alternate view that this thing is annoying. It's junk. It's like sticking a strobe light on top of, say, Mount Everest for funsies. And, okay, you know, I can see that point of view, too. But, hey, they did it, and it's up there, and 
you know, it'll burn up eventually. Yeah, not even eventually. It's only got like uh, about a it's nine got a very short lifespan. Yeah, about yeah. nine months or something like that. And yeah, I was look looking at it, and I think the reports I was hearing was that it's actually not that bright. Black Projects is saying it is point is plus six magnitude from London. That is that's dim. Naked eye visibility in a dark sky site dim. So no, no, it's no. not gonna hmm? plus plus is dim. Plus is dim. Yeah, naked eye. Edge of naked eye visibility. So, edge, right, edge of barely like, visible. I go up to Lake Huron and stand on the beach and I might see this thing. Yeah, that's about the magnitude of uh, Uranus. Yes, Uranus and, at its brightest. And Ceres, stuff like that. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you're not going to be really getting the warm fuzzies out of this thing. So, yeah, for what, for when I looked at it, I was thinking, okay, this thing, okay, it's three feet. It's not real big, but it's covered with triangles. Yes. Each triangle is only about eight to ten inches on a side. So that means only one mirror, one of those triangles is going to be pointing at you. So something that's basically an eight by eight by eight triangle reflecting sunlight off of you, that's not a lot. So it's not like the entire satellite is flat and, you know, the whole thing is you get the whole three feet collect, collecting sunlight and shining it at you. No, it's only a small fraction of it. It's like, yeah, that's not as bright. That can't be bright. Well, and you could argue that because it's not even doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is making people say, ooh, pretty, it's completely useless, which means it's space junk, which we don't need any more space junk than what we've already got. Mm-hmm. So this was like some rocket science-y kind of guy, but I don't think he did the science on this one. He didn't do the math. If you're going to send up... Or an, he it, didn't have much bigger operating budget than what he got. Uh, you know, I think he, it was his own company from what I recall. It's like, well, you're going to send up something that reflects as much as a you know, bathroom mirror? You could just He could have just sent that up. And tumbled, tumbled <laughs> I like it. the review from Black Rogers. He failed. All caps. He failed. Yes. In terms of, of fulfilling the stated goal of his own press release, the Humanity Star is a failure. Yes. It is. Yes. And I like, he should have done the math on how much light it would actually reflect. It's not going to be the whole thing on one area. It's going to be a small percentage of it in any one area. So basically it was badly designed. <sighs> Without, I guess what, I would be more worried. I guess I would be more worried about the humanity star if I had already been through things like, oh my god, companies are going to project like Coke logos on the moon, which mm. hasn't happened. Uh-huh. Like, okay, somebody put up one more piece of junk, and it's not even very sparkly junk, and it's going to burn up. And in the meantime, there's a whole lot of other junk up there to worry about. Exactly. Now, still, if you want to get a better view of something like the iridium satellites. Enjoy those them do a, while you can. Those do a much better job of reflecting sunlight. They do. Because they have big flat but panels. They, but those are being deorbited in the near are, future. Aren't they being replaced, though? I yeah, they're being replaced by things with a substantially different design that won't catch the light in the same way and okay. will not give future stargazers the classic iridium flare experience. So the iridium flare experience is something that is going to be extinct in the near future, which... It might not be a good impulse, but I can understand the impulse to say, well, you know, let's put some more sparkly things up there because mm -hmm. humans like sparkly things. And we can afford it. And we can afford it. If it's cheap. And if, if it's, it's cheap, cheap. Well, if, it's if you've cheap, got, it won't, piggybacking it's, off a of rocket launching nano satellites, if it's cheap, you can it won't get work your sparkly well. thing up there. Yeah. Is it good? No. But is it terrible? There's worse things up there. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of satellites to look for up there without There's adding. There's a lot of satellites. Without adding, yeah, yeah, without adding one that satellites. is. Now, if you want to do it for reflection purposes, with adding one that has less reflectivity than a piece of junk, makes it a piece of sub junk <laughs> that somebody spent money on. <laughs> Well, somebody else is going to come along with more money and a bigger budget and a bigger rocker, rocket and deploy a bigger sparkly thing. Let's hope they do the math. Do. 
I guess we can kind of thank somebody for, you know, sending up a piece of junk and they weren't smart enough to do the math to figure out it's not going to reflect very much light. And then especially claim that it's going to reflect a whole bunch more. Not going to happen. So, so don't worry about them. And you probably won't be able, you won't be able to see this thing unless you look for it. And, and most people I know that won't even look for asteroids that are at that magnitude or dwarf planets. You know, how many people okay, in, our, in our chat room here, how many people have actually seen the dwarf planet series? Go ahead, put it out there in our chat room. See how many people. It gets a lot of amateur astronomers there, and some people look for asteroids. Some people don't. Obviously, comets. I'm not sure that I have. Have you, have you seen it? Uh, I've seen I have. a few asteroids. Mm-hmm. So it's just sure. a better what people are interested in. I'm mean, amateur astronomers oh. or some that are interested in certain so things. And do I mean live? Yes, live. Uh, through a telescope or binoculars. Nope, like Project Tazin. So, yes. Uh, just depends on what you're interested in. I mean, I mostly started looking for, uh, obviously, planets. And then the galaxies was a big thing for me. And the solar observing. I was doing all the messy objects of uh, um Planetary nebula, I kind of like those. I've done a lot of things, but I go from one to the another to the another. I haven't looked at, well, it's been uh, a couple of years since I've seen an asteroid. It was one of those that flew close by the Earth a few years ago. So I got that one, but haven't done any regular observations lately. So that's the way it is with people. They just look at, have their own specific interest in certain things of astronomy, and then they, some don't, some do. No big deal. Oh, let's see. What else did I have? Something else that was popular. Oh, another popular thing that was coming up. Again, I lost the article. Uh, it was about dwarf planet Pluto. And I'm trying to bring it back again to get rid of the dwarf planet designation for it. Um, the argument was was from a planetary scientist. I can't remember his name. He says, well, the IAU people are, are not planetary scientists, so they shouldn't really be defining what a planet is. And they said, well, does it has other criteria, which makes it more like a planet, like, well, sweeping out its orbit. Well, nothing totally sweeps out its orbit. And the other characteristics, you know, whether it's elliptical or not, well, obviously the round thing is a big criteria for for being a planet, but elliptical orbit, well, how elliptical is a planet and how elliptical is not a planet type of things. A lot of discussions and some trying, some people are trying to bring back the Pluto as a planet thing. Well, I'm with him that the IEU definition is poppycock. I'll quote Black Projects because he's right. None of the planets in the solar system have swept out their orbits. Right, because there's still some debris there. Yeah, that's a cruddy definition. The spherical thing, okay, I get the spherical thing. Mm-hmm. Having and enough mass that you mold your particles into a sphere. Mm-hmm. I get that. I like that. That rules out something like Vesta, mm-hmm. which is a cool object. But I think Vesta is the point at which we can look at Ceres and look at Vesta and say, Ceres is a planet. Vesta's a um, nice try, no banana. But, but then it's also a matter of definition, too. How round is round enough? Because we're so not what, round. We are an what, oblate spheroid. Right. So what if you happen to come across a really nice, round, 10-meter rock? Really super round <laughs> within the criteria well, of a planet. So well, what I is it? I was thinking more, what if you've got like a hot Jupiter that is rotating incredibly fast and is compressed into one of these bizarre shapes like we see some of the... The stars that rotate very rapidly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're not round. Right. And then there's also, <laughs> sorry, arguments of how about the not quite a star stars? Brown yeah. dwarfs, super Jupiters. Uh, there are rogue planets out there. Yes. There are rogue brown dwarfs and other, other objects too that don't associate them with a the star. They don't actually orbit a star. Well, technically speaking, the definition proffered by the IAU rules out anything orbiting a star that's not the sun, which means exoplanets are planets, at which point you may as well go off and drink some grog because the whole thing is stupid. <laughs> so kind of hard to define. 
So Oh, you but, can define it. It's just the definition we've got is very unsatisfactory. Uh-huh. So somebody's, well, basically you just got to kind of make a decision and draw your line in the sky and stick on one, one side of it or the other side. What else can you do? Yeah, I'm in the camp of like, okay, if we have to memorize like 1,500 planets, fine, whatever. I, I know. They're planets. Mm-hmm. Don't give me that. Well, it's too difficult for school children to get past eight planets. Like, do you know what school children in Japan have to learn just to get the language, written language? Pretty sure, sure they can master more than eight planets. Yeah, but... Michael, for Michael, our engineer, says we don't make them memorize every mountain. Like, no, we don't, but we do make them memorize 26 alphabetical characters, and that's just in English. Mm-hmm. And then well, that works for, countries kind of works have for the English Roman alphabet, and then, you know, yeah. other things. Well, the alphabet's kind of a good thing to memorize. You know. It's a good thing to memorize, but it shows that you for can get up to things. 26 with no problem. Mm-hmm. Now, okay, every single moon of Saturn? I know. Yeah, okay, no. no or, I, think, uh, I think we had a narrow definition of moons to kick out all the junk. There you go. Yeah, well, okay, so this, like, this... Um, Spherical, fluffy. Yeah, let's thing. talk about the spherical is, criteria. Is, is that a real moon because it's round-ish? Within a certain criteria. Yeah. I think yeah. we ought to have a different word to describe moons like Ganymede, Eo, Europa, and Callisto versus random, irregular rubble piles <laughs> that happen to be orbiting uh, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. I don't think we have a topic of artificial planet do we well we used to have a word for artificial object it was moon and then we hit on satellite so it's not a very good word is is a satellite (laughs) orbiting a planet if the satellite is orbiting the sun independently is it a satellite or is it a planet or is it something else Anyways, all right, down to a couple minutes here. A couple of uh, notes on meteor showers this time of year for the next uh, week or so. We've got uh, basically four four meteor showers. The Athelion, which is pretty low rate one. Uh, Alpha Antilids peaks in February the 1st. February Epsilon Virginids peaks on February the 3rd. And Eticorvids peaks on january the 22nd so still some meteor showers out there and this list is from the american meteor society so they update it every week so you can check that out and it is about time for us to head on out of here as we've uh, come to the end of our programming so i want to say thanks to everybody that's been in our chat room tonight really appreciate yeah, you night, guys Yep. Guys and gals, thank you very much. So far, Aquafuse, Savage with Sedge, Light Breeze, you me, Glenn, Plaid Max, Sister Plaid, Black Projects, all joining us tonight. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you being here. And, of course, we'll be back uh, next week. Don't forget, we repeat this program every four hours for the next 24 hours. And coming up after Space Pirate Radio is, of course, Astronomy Ireland. So we'll listen in, listen into that. It's always a good show. And say hi. I'll say hi to everybody in Astronomy Ireland listening. Any last parting shots from you, Diane? I like calling us a twin planet system. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. See you next week. Clear skies, y'all. We hope that you've enjoyed this program from AFM Radio, the broadcast service of Astronomy.fm. This program has been released under Creative Commons license. Please contact us for details. You may find more of our AFM original programs on our website. It's really easy to find us. We are astronomy.fm. You may also find us in the iTunes radio listings near the top of the News Talk section and also as an iTunes podcast selection. We'd love to hear your comments. Please email us at radio at astronomy.fm. Thanks so much for being part of the voice of astronomy around the world and across the known universe. This is astronomy.fm radio. AFM.